What's up everybody, Dan again, StockTrades.ca. Welcome back to the StockTrades YouTube channel. In this week's video, I'm actually going to be talking about stocks. I know for the last while I've been stuck on ETFs. There was a very big reaction, positive reaction, to me talking about specific types of ETFs in different sectors. But I figured for this video, I would return to stocks, particularly three stocks that could be a solid option for your tax-free savings account moving forward in 2023 and beyond. So with that said, let's get right into the video and speak on these three stocks. So everybody, before we get fully into the video, remember, like this video, head down below, subscribe to the channel, drop a comment down below, and most importantly, thank you for 15,000 subscribers couldn't have done it without you. And also we have a market mindset episode up over at Stock Trades Premium. We talk about mortgage exposure, net interest margins, provisions for credit losses, what we feel are the best opportunities right now when it comes to banks. And you can grab that video with a 14 day trial to premium. You don't even need to enter a credit card. It is a true no obligation 14 day trial. So that is in the description below. So overall, with a tax-free savings account, my own personal strategy is to invest most of my TFSA in my income payers and my more blue chip Canadian options. I think a lot of people run into the issue that they feel that they need to take a lot of added risk when it comes to their TFSA in order to amplify those tax-free gains. But what they don't really take into account is the fact that they could be facing heavy losses if they get too speculative with their tax-free savings account. And the end result of this is you could end up permanently losing tax-free savings account room. So quick example, say somebody has $80,000 inside of their tax-free savings account, they've maxed it out and they go and end up losing $40,000 on a speculative stock on the Canadian market. Next year, they don't get that $40,000 back. They'll simply get their $6,000 in new contribution room. They'll be able to top that up to $46,000. And in reality, that $40,000 speculative play has just costed you $40,000 in tax tax-free contribution room that you can use to compound growth throughout the entirety of your life. So it is pretty important and obviously you're free to do whatever you want to do. But for me, I try to take a more conservative approach with my tax-free savings account. It contains most of my blue chip options in terms of US non-dividend payers and Canadian dividend payers. And then for the more speculative end, uh, the small cap end, the micro cap end, I tend to use my RSP and my taxable account. This actually allowed me to file quite a bit of capital losses last year with my more speculative options, which allowed me to offset some large gains in my taxable account through energy stocks. So it's important we don't get too caught up on absolutely maximizing these tax-free gains, trying to hit a home run inside of our tax-free savings account. Because to me, taking on that much risk is just simply not worth it considering you could lose the contribution room. And if you end up trading actively inside of the account, you can also get burnt. As we recently seen the last you know few months, somebody getting caught trading inside of their TFSA, they're charged taxes, it gets very messy. And ultimately, treat this account as a safe haven for compounding capital. I know people who have grown their TFSA to over $200,000 simply investing in strong Canadian companies. They do not need to be small cap, mid cap, home run style options. So this video, I do have three blue chip Canadian companies that you can consider for your TFSA today. And two of them are going to be companies that are highly rate sensitive. And that is exactly why I have them in this video right now. It appears at least for now that interest rates are not going to continue to go up. In fact, they are more likely to go down than they are to go up. Unless inflation rears its ugly head again, inflation starts to pick back up and the Bank of Canada needs to continue to raise. However, they're under a ton of pressure when it comes to the Canadian housing market to keep rates flat. I think we saw that, you know, 20% of a company like CIBC's mortgages are in negative amortization, meaning your mortgage balance is growing. So it's in the best interest for the Bank of Canada to number one, protect Canadians against inflation. That is the number one goal of the bank. They really, in essence, don't care about the housing market. They, they do 
but ultimately the end goal is for them to stave off inflation. So if that comes to fruition, inflation continues to go down, it is highly likely we see rates decrease to provide some relief for Canadian borrowers, especially when it comes to mortgages. So I included two relatively rate sensitive companies because if rates start to come down, it is highly likely that earnings from these companies will start to go up, especially considering where their revenue streams come from. Now, a lot of these companies also are a little bit of what they call bond proxies. They tend to trade in line with interest rates, much like a bond, primarily because their earnings are so reliable. So when bonds, when GICs, when fixed income investments, when interest rates on those go up, it becomes less attractive to hold these stocks and take on the equity risk, when in reality, you could just buy a fixed income investment that could give you guaranteed income very similar to the these slower growing companies. However, now that interest rates are going to start coming down or at least stay flat through 2023, maybe start coming down in 2024, they do provide attractive opportunities right now, in my opinion, to be added or at least added to a watch list in your portfolio. So the first one we're gonna get to is BCE. They trade under the ticker BCE on both the New York Stock Exchange and the Toronto Stock Exchange. So one thing I do wanna say about these articles that I'm going to speak on right now, we have hundreds of these over at stocktrades.ca. A lot of people just think we solely focus on YouTube when in fact we have one of the largest stock focused websites in the country, over 205,000 visitors every single month. So if you want more content like this, more than anything you're going to get on those basic investment websites out there, head to stocktrades.ca and have a peek at some of our articles. So BCE, I mean, if you wanna look at how compounding returns work, you don't need to look much farther than BCE. If you had invested $10,000 in this company in the mid 1990s, you'd be sitting on a whopping $425,000 right now if you reinvested the dividends. That's a 42 bagger from you know a blue chip Canadian company and this is a company that was relatively prominent even 20 years ago today. This isn't something you know like a micro cap or small cap stock that you would have had to gamble with in order to get those returns. So is it the fastest growing telecom in the country? Not really. Uh, I would give that to TELUS or at least as of right now, Quebecer is growing fairly fast as well. But there is no doubt that BCE has been impacted by the high rate environment a little bit more than other telecoms considering its heavy debt loads and could actually stand to benefit the greatest if rates start going downwards. So it has a market cap of around 57, $59 billion. And it's not only one of the largest telecoms in Canada, but one of the largest companies period in Canada. This is a true blue chip stock. So often when we think of telecoms, when we're in the East, we often think of Rogers. And when we're in the West, we often think of TELUS. TELUS is very prominent where I am at out in Calgary, but Rogers, not so much. Whereas if you go over to say Toronto, Rogers is more prominent, but overall BCE is absolutely everywhere. They are concentrated across the country and they have the largest uh, wireline wireless network in the country and the largest subscriber base in the country. If you were to pick a blue chip telecom, although all of them were probably blue chip companies, BCE is definitely the most prominent. So telecom industry, you know, they often offer high yields. BCE, no exception. It's the highest yielding in the sector, typically in the high 5% to mid 6% range. And it also has a 14 year dividend growth streak. Now, a lot of people don't know this, and you know, 14 years may seem like a short dividend streak for a company like BCE, but this is due to an interruption caused by a previous purchase in the Ontario Teachers Plan that ultimately fell through. So they were going to get purchased by the OTP, but ultimately that fell through, and in the whole acquisition situation, they had to freeze the dividend. So they lost their dividend growth streak. I am fairly confident that if this hadn't have happened, BCE would be sitting on you know 20 plus straight years of dividend growth. So ultimately, this is the most important part. Many investors are concerned about the payout ratios when it comes to telecoms. And I'm not going to go very deep in this video into it because I'm going to link to another video above where I speak on why the telecom sector's dividends are not as 
unsafe as they would seem. Free cash flow is a very misleading factor when it comes to telecoms right now, especially because of the money that they invested back into the business when lending was practically free, when policy rates were at, you know, 0.25%. These companies borrowed a lot of cash, spent a lot of free cash flow on expanding their infrastructure when money was cheap. And now that they're scaling it back, you're going to start seeing these free cash flow payout ratios, these earnings payout ratios that are abnormally high, you know, 120, 130%. Those are going to start tracking downwards if these companies can hit their free cash flow guidances, which I talk about in that video. So again, I'll drop a link up above and you can watch that to get an idea of the structure of telecom payout ratios. So ultimately BCE is trading at a relatively attractive valuation, at least when we compare it to historical averages. If we go to valuation here, we can see that the company is trading at around 19 times forward earnings. This is right along the lines of their five-year averages. When we look to trailing 12-month earnings, it's actually trading at a slight premium. But again, I really believe that if rates start to come downwards later this year or early next year, it's definitely going to impact the valuation of BCE. And I think people are going to start warming up to telecoms once again. If we go to actual estimates for BCE, they figure that they're going to grow at a you know mid to high single digit pace. We have earnings of $3.36 that they filed in 2022 and for 2023, they actually expect those earnings to dip by a small amount. We're looking at around 16 cents. But after that, the company is expected to head back to mid to high single digit growth in terms of earnings and revenue. And this is highly likely because analysts are figuring that policy rates are going to come down. Now, if we head to 2024, we're seeing earnings of $3.40 and earnings of $3.74 in 2025. Now, one of the reasons that BCE does not do well in a high rate environment is, as I mentioned, the fact that you can buy fixed income investments that pay the sort of yields BCE does without taking on the equity risk. But it's also the fact that this company does have a lot of debt on the balance sheet. In fact, if we go to the key stats here and we look at long-term debt, we're seeing nearly $32 billion in long-term debt. And we're seeing around 3.2 billion in trailing 12 month cash flow. So this is a lot of debt load to be on the company. However, this is the nature of the business. The company can take on this much debt because its cash flow is so reliable and it's also a very capital intensive business. So when you get companies like this, ones where the cash flows are very reliable, the debt loads are very high, we tend to think that they have relatively weak balance sheets. And when we go to uh, BCE's liquidity and solvency, we can see they have a debt to equity of 1.4, which is actually relatively high when we compare it to the broader market. However, it is very common for a telecom or a utility to have this high debt to equity. They need to utilize that debt to expand to grow earnings. And, and as a result, we actually see a relatively weak balance sheet, a current ratio and a quick ratio of 0.56 and 0.41, and also interest coverage ratios that you know are relatively strong actually for a situation like this but they're likely weaker than a company in a better financial position debt wise. But again, BCE, the cash flows are consistent. It can maintain a thinner balance sheet just because of the moat it has, the debt levels it has to take on to expand. If you're looking for a telecom, it is certainly one you can add to your watch list. Okay, so the next stock that I wanna go over and is one that is going to be a very unique play when it comes to income and just overall returns in general, and that is Canadian Natural Resources. They trade under the ticker CNQ, and they do trade both north and south of the border as well. So you can buy this on the New York Stock Exchange and the Toronto Stock Exchange. Now, Canadian Natural Resources is in my opinion, the best oil and gas producer on the planet. And overall, I'm not really a fan of holding cyclical options for the long term. I mean, if you've been a stock trades follower for any reasonable amount of time, 
we've always said that you know these aren't long-term holds uh, they tend to be too cyclical they really don't produce strong long-term returns they're mostly you know you have to time the bottom sell the top in order to make any outsized performance but in the case of Canadian natural resources I think there's an argument for holding this one over the long term especially in the short to midterm here because there is going to be a lot of cash flow returned back to investors so the reason why Canadian natural is able to operate so well is it has rock bottom break even prices I mean during the pandemic we saw numerous companies both major producers like Suncor and junior producers cut the dividend they really could not sustain prices at you know negative WTI prices or even in the low to mid teens but Canadian natural was not only able to maintain the dividend but they grew the dividend during the COVID-19 pandemic they actually came out and issued a dividend raise and this was pretty much a testament to the company's financial strength so again the two factors not only allowed the company maintain the dividend but raise the dividend while others were cutting at a record pace fastest pace we've ever witnessed in history and this is also why its share price held up admiringly well during the pandemic so the company made maintained positive cash flow in 2020 free cash flows of over 2.2 billion so in this environment if WTI can even maintain 70 plus a barrel not to mention the prices that we've seen at the pandemic you can see why a company like Canadian natural is going to print cash and in a situation like this you would think that it would return a certain portion of free cash flow back to investors and it would utilize the rest in order to expand but that is not necessarily what Canadian natural wants to do and I did make a typo in this portion of the article it says that once the company gets its debt below 8 billion it will return 100% of free cash flow but that's actually wrong it's 10 billion and let's look to their annual report where we can actually see this policy in writing so our free cash flow allocation policy is unique and balanced providing significant returns to shareholders through dividends and share repurchases while continuing to strengthen the balance sheet so in 2022 we allocated approximately 50% of the company's free cash flow to share purchases and 50% to the balance sheet concurrently with the release of Canadian Naturals year-end results the company has enhanced its free cash flow allocation policy due to being in a strong financial position and having sustainable cash flow profiles so particularly when you compare the debt levels to the size diversity and long life low decline nature of our high value reserves so this is the most important part here as a result the board of directors has confidence in the sustainability and reliance of the company to support accelerating incremental shareholder returns to 100% of free cash flow when the company's net debt reaches 10 billion dollars so once the company's net debt reaches 10 billion the free cash flow allocation policy will be adjusted to define free cash flow as adjusted funds flow less dividends less total capex in the year so this is a material dividend policy if we look to Canadian Naturals debt structure right now we can see that they have around 11.44 billion in trailing 12 month debt once that gets down to 10 billion dollars they will return hundred percent of their free cash flow after capex back to shareholders via buybacks via special dividends whatever it may be this is going to be a company that is going to be very shareholder friendly over the next few years if WTI can maintain these price points this is a policy that I'm not sure any other oil and gas company operates I wouldn't necessarily call me an absolute expert in that area there's much smarter people in the oil and gas sector than I but I don't know of another company that returns a hundred percent of free cash flows back to its investors so an investment in Canadian natural right now will likely benefit an investor not only through price appreciation but you're probably going to be seeing very heavy share buybacks and you're probably going to be seeing very heavy special dividends so from a valuation basis, Canadian Natural is very, very cheap. 10.3x forward earnings. But the thing is, these oil and gas companies are always cheap. We can't really think of these investments in oil and gas as a you know normal investment in the stock market. The growth rates are going to achieve the cash flow they generate 
any other company, I believe, outside of the oil and gas sector, the multiples would be twice as high. But because a lot of people are bearish on the industry moving forward, they tend to trade at very cheap multiples. I mean, we can see right now they're trading at 65 times trailing 12 month free cash flow. And if you look to the five year average of 8.6 here, this is lower than historical averages. However, it is very likely that free cash flow is going to dip moving forward as the price of oil actually has gone down quite a bit. So it's not a surprise to see that it's trading below historical averages as it is highly unlikely that they generate the you know $14.29 billion in free cash flow that they did over the last 12 months. So when we look to overall estimates, we can see that, yeah, they're, they earned 11.44 a share in 2022. And when we come down to 2023, that is expected to dip to $7.51. However, most of this is likely already priced into the stock. As you can tell on the valuation side, it's pretty cheap right now. And if we look forward to 2024, we're looking at you know mid single digit growth in terms of earnings. So overall, Canadian Natural is, in my opinion, one of the best oil and gas producers on the planet. And this is a good opportunity for those to take advantage of this cash flow policy, because I have next to no doubt that the company will get down to that $10 billion debt threshold. And in that situation, it is going to start returning a lot of capital back to shareholders. So for the next and final stock I wanna go over, it is a regulated utility that is no doubt going to hit Dividend King status next year at 50 straight years of dividend growth, and that is Fortis. They trade under the ticker FTS, and they trade again both north and south of the border. So Fortis. Fortis is one of the most reliable income payers on the planet. And it's very important that you understand the regulated utility nature of the business to understand why Fortis is so reliable. So what exactly is a regulated utility? So as a regulated utility, Fortis owns the power lines, they own the meter box, they own the means of power generation. They own absolutely everything needed pretty much up to the meter box to supply you with power. So what this means is that competition cannot easily enter the market and steal market share from Fortis. In fact, it is virtually impossible. They own all the means of power generation and power distribution. So as a result, they have about the most reliable earnings you can bank on. So Fortis will then go to the municipality. They'll discuss power rates that virtually guarantee a profit for them, but are also appropriate for the consumer. And from there, again, this practically stymies any sort of competitor entering the space. So as a result, Fortis, 99% of Fortis's earnings come from regulated utilities. Now, another major regulated utility player that a lot of people actually mistake for a renewable energy player is Algonquin Power and Utilities. They were set to acquire uh, Kentucky Power, which would have added to their regulated utility base, but the acquisition looks to be falling through. So Fortis is not the only regulated utility player here in Canada, but it certainly is the most reliable with the longest amount of history. So the company has 49 straight years of consecutive dividend increases. So it is a Canadian dividend aristocrat. It would be a US dividend aristocrat as well. But this company is one year shy of becoming a dividend king, which is 50 straight years of dividend increases. So not only is it reliable with its dividend growth, but it is also reliable at the rate in which it grows the dividend. So the company typically guides to a payout ratio in the 70% range. And if we look to the payout ratios right now, right now they're at about 52%. It's quite a variable payout ratio that actually very rarely hits the 70% range. Now we can see that the payout ratio did rise during two notable events. We can see that uh, in 2014, the oil collapse, the payout ratio got quite high. And then we can see during the COVID-19 pandemic, the payout ratio also got quite high. But I would expect it to normalize in this range moving forward, the 50 to 60% range. Now, in terms of dividend growth, they aim to deliver four to 6% annual dividend growth guidance through to 2027. Now, this guidance did used to be bigger, but the increase in interest rates has caused this company to slow down its dividend growth. There is a very strong likelihood it does hit this four to six 
dividend growth rate. And we can see the pace of dividend growth. It's clearly accelerated in the late uh, 2000s. And we can see 49 years of consecutive growth. Now, again, I am a total return investor. Not only do I want a dividend, but I also want some capital appreciation. And the thing about Fortis is it has been known to provide very strong total returns as well. If we head back to the main chart here and we go to a 10 year total return, we can see that Fortis has returned 147.6%. Now, if we go to something like the Toronto Stock Exchange, it has outperformed the TSX index if we consider the reinvested dividends. So we have to go total return. So we're talking around 147% compared to 124. So it's outperformed its benchmark index over the last decade. And if we check for annualized returns here, it's actually returned 9.49% annually. This is absolutely outstanding for a slow growing blue chip regulated utility. Now, if we span this out to five years, it actually accelerates to 10.7%. However, if we start spanning shorter amounts, it has started to underperform. We can see three years, 7.27 and over the last year, negative 1.14%. This is because of the rate increases and the impact it has on utilities. Again, much like BCE, Fortis has very high debt loads. We can see total long-term debt of $28.6 billion, and we can see that the company only has a market capitalization that is you know, $28.98 billion. So pretty much it has as much debt as it does market capitalization. So this is going to impact the company a bit. We reached out to investor relations not too long ago when it came to the Algonquin power situation to check the floating rate debt and Fortis actually sits in the mid single digit range in terms of floating rate debt. This is not even close to the 20 plus percent that Algonquin had. So the exposure isn't as drastic there as well. And also when we head down to the balance sheet, we can see that much like BCE, it does on the surface look to have a very weak balance sheet. We can see a debt to equity of 1.36, which these high numbers in terms of debt to equity, completely normal for a utility. And we can go down and see a current ratio of 0.64 and a quick ratio of 0.29. This indicates a weak balance sheet, but again, the cash flows are so consistent from this company, it can maintain a pretty thin balance sheet and still be very, very healthy financially. Especially if we look to interest coverage ratios, they're getting a little low at 2.66, but this is going to be completely normal for a regulated utility. If we go up to the dividend, I did not mention what it yields. It yields around 3.8% at the time of filming. So this is a mid yielder. I wouldn't necessarily call it a high yielder, but you're also going to get that combo of total return as well, which in my opinion is what the vast majority of investors need to be looking for. Uh, when we look to forward estimates, there's likely going to be not much growth priced in. Yeah, we can see that $2.76 per share they reported in 2022. That's going to go up to $2.95 this year estimated. And then as we can see through 2024 and 2025, we're expecting low to mid single digit earnings growth, which is right in line with the company's dividend growth rates. And once rates start to go down, there is a good chance that the growth rate in terms of earnings starts to increase. So everybody, that's it for the video. This is my first video on stocks that I've done in a very long time. I don't know if I rambled on too long about these specific stocks or if I didn't go into enough detail. So I need you to head down below to the comments. Let me know how I did. Let me know if you wanna see more information on stocks like this, or if you want me to speak more on exchange traded funds like I have been in the past. Overall, I think these are three outstanding options for your TFSA. Fortis is actually one of the first stocks I ever bought. I've owned it for a very long time. It's a very reliable payer. I own TELUS over BCE, but I do understand the opportunity with BCE right now, especially considering the high yield, the uh, potential for earnings growth in the future, depending on how rates go, and their blue chip nature and discounted valuation 
probably makes it a better play for the more risk averse investor rather than TELUS, which does provide higher growth but trades at a much higher earnings multiple. And finally, Canadian Natural, a very unique position where I think investors are really going to love the returns when it comes to buybacks and special dividends, especially considering the cash this company is expected to generate in the future. Again, smash the like button, head down below, subscribe to the channel, comment, let me know what you want to see next, and I will see you next time with more great Canadian investment content.